and then he turned and slumped back against it, sliding to the floor. All of his patience, his subtle pressures, the ground beneath him shuddered, threatened to break. One misstep, and it would crumble, and he would lose Victor and Marcella both, and with them, justice, closure, and any hope of freedom. It might already be too late. He studied the back of his hand, where a single smear of blood marred the knuckles. How many will die for the sake of his pride, mused Victor. Eli looked up and saw the phantom standing over him again. He shook his head. Stell would rather let the city burn than admit that we are on the same side. Victor stared at the wall as if it were still a window. He doesn't know how patient you are, he said. Doesn't know you like I do. Eli cleaned the blood from his hand. No, he said softly. No one ever has. Roman numeral 19. Two weeks ago. First in white. June whistled softly as she rinsed the blood from her hands. Marcella had swept out of the penthouse in her red dress, Jonathan trailing like a shadow at her heels. She didn't say where she was going or when she'd be back. Didn't ask June to come with, which was fine with her. Jonathan might be a lapdog, but June preferred to work alone. Which, mind you, wasn't the same as being alone. Too much silence, too much space, but idle hands and all that. Which is how June ended up wrists deep in someone else's blood. She hadn't taken a new job in more than a week. Hadn't needed to. Hutch had been the final name on her personal list, and Marcella had been working up a roster of obstacles, as she called them, men and women most likely to resist her rapid ascent. So whenever June got bored, she just went out and knocked a few off the list. Marcella didn't seem to mind. Some people were matches, a bit of light and no heat, and some were furnaces, all heat but little light. And then, once in a blue moon, there was a bonfire. Something so hot and bright you couldn't stand too near without burning. Marcella was a bonfire if ever June saw one. Of course, even bonfires eventually went out, smothered by their own ashes. But in the meantime, June had to admire the other woman's ambition, and had to admit she was actually enjoying herself. The only thing missing was Sidney's soft laugh, her bright smile. June snapped the water off, dried her hands, met her gaze in the reflection. No, not hers. Not her hazel eyes, not her red hair, not her freckles. But she'd found herself taking this aspect, brown waves, green eyes, sharp chin, more and more often. It felt strange, holding on to one face long enough for other people to remember it. Was it worth it? Sid had asked her that night, when she confessed to giving up her face, her life, herself. And it was. It was. But that didn't stop June from craving the light of recognition in someone's eyes the comfort of being seen, being known. She could be anyone these days, a million outfits at her disposal, but she tried not to get too attached to any of them. After all, people died, and when they did, their shape vanished from her closet. Sometimes she didn't even know they were gone, until she went looking. Only one shape was guaranteed to be there, and it was the one she wouldn't wear. June heard the door swing open, the signature click of Marcella's heels on the marble floor. June went to find her and passed Jonathan on his way to the balcony, a cigarette between his teeth. Marcella shrugged out of a white trench coat. What have you been up to? asked June, leaning against the wall. Making connections, said Marcella. She drew a folded piece of paper from her purse. Since you have a knack for finding people, I have a knack for killing people, corrected June. Finding them is simply a prerequisite. Well, I have a job for you. Marcella held out the slip. Did you know that there's someone out there killing Eos? Yeah, said June, taking the folded slip. It's called Eon. Marcella persisted. I'm talking about an EO. Someone like us, killing people like us. Which I find rather vexing. June unfolded the paper, her gaze flitting over the list. Fulton, Dresden, South Broughton, Brindhaven, Halloway. She stilled, recognition flitting like a pulse inside her chest. What is this? The locations, said Marcella, of the EO's last five kills. June didn't look at her phone, but she knew that if she did, if she opened her texts from Sydney, she'd see these same places listed, each in response to the question June always asked. Where are you these days? June wanted to know, because the world was big, wanted to know because Sydney was hers to protect. She read the list again. So this was what Victor had been doing. 
why the three of them were always on the move. But June doubted that he was purely an executioner. Doubted it was that simple. We're looking for someone who can help. Maybe that was true. Maybe Victor was being thorough, covering his tracks afterward. It made sense, considering he was supposed to be dead. Let me get this straight, said June, pocketing the list. There's an EO out there, killing other EOs. And you want to find him. Eon wants to find him, said Marcella. And they want my help. June let out a short, humorless laugh. That's what you meant by making connections. Indeed, said Marcella. I told you I would handle them. But I had to give the boy something, and it was either you and Jonathan or this. Marcella leaned on the marble counter. They've given me two weeks to find this EO killer. And what happens then? Oh, mused Marcella, tracing the veins in the stone. I imagine that Director Stell will decide I'm more trouble than I'm worth. You don't seem worried, said June. Marcella straightened. He's underestimated what I can do with two weeks. In the meantime, I suppose we should find that EO. June's mind was turning, but she kept her voice airy, light. What are you going to do with him? You know, said Marcella, I haven't decided yet. Roman numeral 20. A week and a half ago. Downtown Witten. June had texted Sydney on her way to the car, sat idling there until she saw the three small dots that signaled an incoming reply. Sid, Witten. June put the location into her GPS and shifted into gear as the map came up on the screen. From there, it was easy to find them. How's the view, she'd asked. Tell me what you see. Such a simple question, made routine by years of checking in, asking such small, seemingly innocuous questions as a way to condense the distance between them. June soon learned that Sidney and Victor and Mitch were staying in a nondescript apartment building. A ten-story stack of tan stone blocks on a street filled with the same, the only relief a small park on the corner, the bright flags on the hotel across the street. June checked in to that same hotel the next day, and waited. Waited for proof that Victor was the EO killer that he was the person Stell was looking for, the one Marcella promised to find. She had been waiting for three days. Victor came and went, a constant, relentless force, carving slow circles through the small city, and June would follow at a distance, snapping photos with her phone. But so far, he'd yet to make a move. June was getting restless. Still, it hadn't all been a waste of time. She'd gotten to see Sid, hadn't let the girl see her, of course. There would be time for that later. But once, she trailed Mitch and Sidney to a movie, sat right behind them, and let herself pretend they were there together, like a family. It had been nice. But mostly, June waited. She hated waiting. Right now she was pacing on the curb outside the hotel, dressed as an old man, a cigarette hanging from her fingers. She looked up now and then, waiting for the balcony door five floors up and two over to slide open, waiting for Sid to emerge into the afternoon sun. A few minutes later, she did. That familiar blonde bob caught the light and she stepped out onto the patio. June smiled. Despite Sidney's complaints, she was growing up. The changes were subtle, sure. But June knew people well enough to read those subtleties, even if they had less to do with height and weight and more to do with posture, poise. Sid had explained the problem of her aging sometime around her 16th birthday. It was the cold, or at least that was Victor's theory, that the hypothermia she'd suffered had slowed everything about her. Sid had complained that, at the rate things seemed to be going, her teens would take forever. But then June had pointed out that so would her twenties, and in her own experience, those were the best years anyway. Sid had gotten quiet then, silence stretching across cities. And by the time I'm thirty, she'd said, everyone I know will be dead. Except for Eli. Eli. The way Sidney said that name, as if she was afraid that speaking it too loud would somehow summon him. What about you? She'd asked June with sudden curiosity. Do you age? June had hesitated. She'd glimpsed the shape that hung in the back of her wardrobe, the one she never took out. It hung so perfectly still, beneath its film of disuse, but there was no denying. I do. Now June watched as Sidney sank into a patio chair, head bowed over her phone even as she put her feet up on that giant black dog, who didn't seem to mind at all. A few seconds later, June's cell gave a soft ping. Sid. Are you still in merit? She tipped her head up to savor the warm blue sky, and then lied. June, yeah, it's raining. I hope the weather's nicer there. The front door across the street swung open, and a wraith of a man stepped out. 
shielding his eyes from the sun. It had been three years since June had seen Victor Vale. He didn't look well. His face was a rock worn with deep hollows, and the way he moved, as if he were a length of cord, strung so tight that any force might snap it. He hurts people, Sidney had said. But June had been watching for days, and aside from the way strangers bent out of his path, she hadn't seen him use his power once. He didn't look that strong. He's sick. It's my fault. Victor started down the block. June stubbed out her cigarette and followed, merging with a small group of pedestrians as it passed. With each intersection, strangers peeled away, but others joined, and all the while June kept Victor in her sights. He moved like a ghost through the city, slipping out of its bright heart and into seedier parts before arriving in a district known as the Brickworks. Four warehouses, squat brick buildings like pillars or compass points, framed the blocks that made up the brickworks, and between them a network of bars, betting shops, strip clubs, and darker fare. He didn't need a line or a fence to find the place where good neighborhoods gave way to bad ones. June had lived in enough of both to know by feel. The shift from new steel to old stone, double-glazed windows to spidering glass. The polish worn off and never repainted, curbs glittering with the remains of the last broken bottle. The brickworks didn't even pretend to be respectable. Few places could exude that much trouble in the middle of the day, and given the sheer number of illicit businesses, June guessed the local police were getting a cut to look the other way. By the time she stepped across the proverbial tracks, she'd shifted into an old biker, all gristle and bone, in tattooed sleeves. It wasn't the first time Victor's wanderings had led him, and by extension June, to this corner of the city. He was obviously looking for someone. But the tangle of buildings and the broad daylight made it hard to follow too closely. June fell back and when Victor's pale head vanished through a door at the back of a bar, she changed tactics, returned to the street, and circled until she found a half-rusted ladder hanging from a structurally unstable fire escape. June hauled herself up onto the nearest warehouse roof, boots skimming the tar as, somewhere nearby, a door crashed open. She crossed the roof in time to see a man go crashing backward into a stack of empty crates, muttering curses. Victor came into view a few seconds later. The man on the ground got up, and started toward Victor, only to buckle, as if he'd been struck. Victor's cool voice wafted up like smoke. I will ask you one more time. The man said something, the words low and unintelligible from June's position on the roof. But Victor clearly heard him. With a single upward flick of his hand, the man was forced up to his feet, and Victor shot him in the head. The silencer muffled the violence of the gun's retort, but not its impact. Blood sprayed across the bricks, and the man fell lifeless to the ground. A second later, something seemed to fall in Victor, too. His poise, so tightly held, began to fray, and he swayed a little on his feet before slumping back against the opposite wall. He ran a hand through his light hair and let his head tip back against the brick as he looked up. June lunged backward, breath held, waiting for some sign that he'd seen her. But Victor's gaze had been miles away. She heard his footsteps, slow and even, and by the time she chanced another look over the rooftop edge, he had disappeared around the corner. June found him again, at the edge of the brickworks, followed half a block behind as she dialed Marcella's number. She hesitated before she hit call, not because she had any lingering doubts, but simply because the words would carry weight, consequence, and not just for Victor. Putting him in Eon's path meant endangering Sidney, too. But June would be there. She'd keep her girl safe. The phone rang once, and then Marcella answered. Well. June studied the man in black. His name is Victor Vale. That was fast, said Marcella. And you're sure he's the one they're looking for? Positive, said June. And his power? Pain, said June. She could hear Marcella's smile. Interesting. Is he alone? Yes, said June, as far as I can tell. The words came out effortlessly. Lying was a skill made easy by habit. Besides, Sidney was hers, and June didn't know if she wanted to share. If she could get the girl to merit, maybe. If Marcella succeeded. If the time came when Eos didn't have to hide or run. June knew Sidney was tired of running. In the meantime, there was no need for Marcella to know about the girl. Not yet. I'll stay here, continued June. Keep an eye on things. Wouldn't want Victor to slip away. She frankly didn't care if Eon got their hands on Victor. But she wasn't about to let Sidney fall into the same trap. Unless you need me, she added. No, said Marcella. We'll survive a little longer without your sparkling wit. 
You know, you miss me, said June. Has Merritt built a statue in your honor yet? Marcella only laughed. Not yet, she said. But they will. And June honestly couldn't tell if she was joking. As June followed Victor home, she toyed with the idea of killing him then and there. She knew she shouldn't, but the idea was tempting. It would certainly make things simpler, and she was pretty sure she could manage the kill. The pain wasn't an issue, but that physical control of his would likely make things difficult. Still, June did love a challenge. She turned the idea over like a butterfly knife as she walked. After all, Marcella planned to hand Victor over to Eon. Wouldn't it be a mercy to cut him down instead? It was a boon, of course, that in killing Victor, Sidney would be free, free of her guilt and her attachment. June was still mulling it over when halfway down the block, Victor stumbled. His step changed, lost its smooth stride. She saw him lurch to a stop and then start again, his steps faster, more urgent. June quickened her pace, but as Victor reached the intersection, the light changed, and there was a jostle of bodies, a taxi pulled too far forward, honking horns and hurrying shapes, and in that second, June lost him. She swore, doubling back. She hadn't been that far behind. Where could he have gone? He wasn't on the main road, which meant he'd slipped down a side street. June checked one and then another, and she was at the mouth of the third when she caught sight of him, his back to her, doubled over and clutching at the wall. She started toward him, shifting into a middle-aged woman with mousy brown hair, innocuous, forgettable, and was just about to call out, ask if he was all right, when Victor collapsed. As he did, the air around him rippled, and a second later something slammed into June with all the force of a truck, if a truck were made of current instead of steel. June was thrown backward, her latest shape sloughing away by the time she hit the pavement. Had she been anyone else, the force would have killed her. As it was, she felt it. Not the blast itself, but the back of her head where it hit the ground. Pain cut a shallow line across her scalp, and June sat up, rubbing her head. Her fingers came away dotted with red, and her breath caught, not at the sight of the blood, but the arm, familiar pale skin dotted with freckles. She was herself, vulnerable, exposed. Fuck. June staggered to her feet, swapping out the body, her body, for another, shuddering with relief as the pain was erased, along with every other trace of her true form. And then she remembered Victor. He was slumped, motionless against the alley wall. His head lolled against his chest. He's sick, Sidney had said. I made him sick. But the body on the ground wasn't just sick. It was dead. No pulse, no color, no signs of life. Amazing. After all the time June had spent persuading herself not to kill him, he'd gone and died anyway. At least she thought he was dead. He certainly looked dead. Cautiously, June moved toward the body. She crouched and touched his shoulder, and as she did, something leapt through her fingers, flickered through her mind. Memories. Not all of them, not even a handful. Only one. A lab. A redhead. A current. A scream. It moved through her like static shock. A single glimpse, brief and impossible, bright, and then gone. June recoiled, shaking out her hand, and then she drew her gun and brought the barrel to rest against the man's forehead. Whether or not he was really dead, she could make it stick. He'd made it so easy. Maybe fate was shining on June after all. She thumbed off the safety, let her finger come to rest against the trigger, and then stopped. June could think of a dozen reasons to make sure Victor was dead and only one to stay her hand. Sidney. This was the one thing Sidney would never forgive if she found out. Besides, June didn't want to steal the girl this way. Wanted to win her, fair and square. She told Sidney once that people should choose their family, and she'd meant it. June wanted Sidney to choose her. So she lowered the gun, was just sliding the weapon back into her coat when suddenly, impossibly, Victor moved. June nearly jumped out of her skin, Few things caught her by surprise these days, but the sight of Victor Vale shuddering back to life was enough to give her a fright. His fingers twitched, a small current running visibly over his skin, and then his chest inflated as he drew a deep breath and opened his eyes and looked up. Oh, Christ, said June, one hand to her racing heart. I thought you were dead. For a moment, Victor stared at her with the blank gaze of the very drunk or the hopelessly lost, and then, quick as a spark, the light went on behind his eyes. 
if he was surprised to find himself sitting on the ground, it didn't show. He started to say something, and then stopped, and drew a small black object from between his teeth. A mouth guard. June realized that whatever had happened just now, it wasn't the first time. Victor was looking at June now, his gaze cold and clear. Do I know you? he asked. And there was no thickness in his voice, no disorientation, only study. Don't think so, said June, talking as fast as she could think, relieved she'd shifted into another disarming body, the black-haired girl she'd used in Hutch's office. I was just walking past and saw you lying on the ground. Should I call an ambulance? No, said Victor quietly, rising to his feet. No offense, sir, but you didn't look well a moment ago. I have a condition. Bullshit, thought June. Seizures were a condition. What she'd seen just now was death. I'm fine now, he insisted. That bit seemed true. Whatever had come over Victor, it was already gone. The man who stood before her now was the picture of control. He turned, heading back toward the street. June had a clear shot at the back of his head, but she also had the strange certainty that if she went for her gun now, she'd never get the shot off. The air was humming with power, and none of it was hers. So June's hand stayed at her side as she watched Victor go swearing inwardly. She should have killed him when she had the chance. Roman numeral 21. One week ago. Downtown Witten. Sidney Clark was getting stronger. She'd resurrected three more birds since the first, each feat performed using fewer and fewer pieces. She was just setting her latest victory free when she heard the front door close. Victor was home. She hadn't told him yet about the successes she knew he'd be proud, wanted to see that pride turned toward her, but she didn't want to jinx them, didn't want him to look at her and glimpse the motive behind her progress, the reason for her intensity. Victor was too good at seeing through things. Sidney shut the window and started toward the bedroom door, but halfway there, she felt her steps slow, something catch in her throat. The two voices beyond were muffled, but distinct. Victor's low and steady. He was incompatible. Mitch's halting reply. That was the last one. Something pitched inside Sidney's chest. The last one. She pressed a hand against her sternum, as if trying to stop its fall. She realized what it was as it slipped between her fingers. Hope. I see. That was all Victor said. As if it were a mild setback, and not a death knell. Sidney's head came to rest against the bedroom door, her most recent victory forgotten. She waited until the space beyond was quiet. And then she stepped out into the hall. The door to Victor's room was closed, and Mitch was a dark shape out on the patio, his head bowed, his elbows resting on the rail. In the kitchen, a piece of paper sat crumpled on top of the trash. Sidney drew it out, smoothed it on the counter. It was Victor's last EO profile. His last lead. The page had been reduced to a wall of black lines, interrupted only by five letters, scattered across the page. Fix me. Sidney held her breath. Behind her eyes, the surface of a lake cracked under Victor's feet. Roman numeral 22. One week ago. Downtown Merritt. By the end of the first week, Stell knew he'd made a terrible mistake. He knew it when he saw the sinkhole on Broadway. Knew it when he was called to the collapsed building on Ninth. And he certainly knew it when he stepped into the ballroom at the Continental. He moved through the vast space, a hazard mask cinched over his nose and mouth. The ballroom was high-ceilinged and ornate, a popular place for business execs and powerful families alike to throw parties. Stell assumed that was what had been happening the night before. After all, the tables were still laid out. The gossamer and ribbon still drew ghostly lines through the air. Only the people were missing. No, not missing. A fine patina of ash covered every surface. It was all that was left of the forty-one guests in the Continental's evening register. Needless to say, the scene had tripped the Merritt PD's strange shit alarm. Stell had seen enough. He retreated into the hall, pulling the mask from his face as he dialed. Two rings later, Marcella's smooth voice answered. Hello, Joseph. Do you want to tell me, hissed Stell, what I'm looking at right now? I couldn't say. Then I'll tell you, he snapped. I'm standing outside a ballroom at the Continental. It looks like a fucking snowstorm in there. How peculiar. What part of lying low did you not understand? 
Well, she said coyly, I didn't sign my name in the ashes. He pinched the bridge of his nose. You are making it very hard to look the other way. Crime has gone down as promised. No, said Stell. It's simply been consolidated. He lowered his voice as he paced the hall. Tell me you have something to show me besides this gross display. Preferably something related to the subject of our mutual interest. Marcella sighed. You really do take the fun out of things. I thought we could have lunch to celebrate, but since you're obviously busy, I'll go ahead and tell you now. I found your EO killer. Stell stiffened. Is he with you now? No, said Marcella. But don't worry, a deal's a deal. And I still have a week. Marcella. I'm sending you a photo to whet your appetite. Roman numeral 23. One week ago. Eon. She really was clever, thought Eli. He lay stretched out on the cot, staring up at his reflection in the mirror ceiling as he turned the problem like a coin between his fingers. Through some combination of strategy and luck, Marcella had managed to flank herself with two compatible powers. He lined them up in his mind. The Ruiner, the Shapeshifter, the Force Field. Up close, long distance, and everything between. Together, their powers were nearly impregnable, but find a way to separate them, and Marcella would die just like anyone else. Footsteps sounded beyond the glass, and, a second later, the far wall went clear, revealing a very red-faced Stell. Did you know? Eli blinked and sat up. I'm not omniscient, Director. You'll have to be more specific. Stell slammed a piece of paper against the barrier. A printout. A photograph. Eli swung his legs off the cot and approached the glass. Stilled when he saw the face in the photo. There he was. The narrow face, hawkish in profile, chin grazing the collar of his trench coat. Not a good photo. Not a clear photo. But Eli would recognize him anywhere. Victor Vale. Two years, said Stell. That's how long you've had to track him down, and Marcella delivers this in less than two weeks. You buried it. You knew. But Eli realized, staring at the photo, that he hadn't known. Not really. He'd wanted to be right, wanted to be sure. But there had always been that fissure, a line of doubt. Now it's sealed, smoothed, solid enough to bear the weight of the truth. I guess you didn't burn the body. God damn it, Eli, snarled Stell. He shook his head. How is this possible? Victor's always been terrible at staying dead. How? demanded Stell. Serena's little sister had the inconvenient ability to resurrect the dead. Sidney Clark, you listed her among your kills. Technically, said Eli. Serena was supposed to take care of her. Obviously, she got cold feet. One more thing he'd have to handle himself. Eli dragged his gaze away from the photo. What are you going to do about him? I'm going to find him. You two can each have a cell to rot in. Oh, great, said Eli dryly. We can be neighbors. This isn't a fucking joke, snapped Stell. All your talk of cooperation, I knew it was a ruse. I knew you couldn't be trusted. In the name of God, scoffed Eli. How many excuses will you find to vindicate your own stubbornness? He's been out there, killing humans and EOs, and you knew. I suspected. And you didn't say anything. You didn't burn the body, roared Eli. I put him down, and you let him back up. Victor Vale's continued existence and the deaths he's since accrued. Those are your failures, not mine. Yes, I kept my suspicions from you because I hoped I was wrong. Hoped that you hadn't been so foolish, hadn't failed so catastrophically. And if you had, well, then I knew my warnings would fall on deaf ears. You want Victor? Fine, I'll help you take him again. He went to the low shelf, drew the hunter's folder from the row of case files. Unless you'd rather let Marcella lead you through her hoops instead. He dropped the folder in the open tray. I'm sure once she figures out Victor's value, she'll make you pay every cent. Stell said nothing, his face a poor imitation of a stone wall as he slowly reached for the file. But Eli, of course, could still see every crack. My advisement, he said, is on the last page. Stell skimmed the instructions in silence and then looked up. You think this will work? It's how I'd catch him, said Eli, truthfully. Stell turned to go, but Eli called him back. Look me in the eye, said Eli, 
and tell me that when you find Victor you will kill him once and for all. Stell met his gaze. I'll do as I see fit. Eli flashed a feral grin. Of course you will, he said. And so will I. Roman numeral 24. Two days ago. Downtown Witten. Sydney was back on the ice. It stretched in every direction. She couldn't see the banks, couldn't see anything but the frozen stretch of lake ahead, behind, the plume of her own breath. Hello? She called. Her voice echoed across the lake. The ice crackled just behind her and she spun around, expecting to see Eli. But there was no one there. And then from somewhere in the distance, a sound. Not the cracking of the lake. A short, sharp tone. Sydney sat up. She didn't remember falling asleep, but she was curled on the sofa, doll at her feet, and thin morning light seeping in the windows. The sharp tone sounded again, and Sid looked around for her phone before she realized that the sound was coming from Mitch's computer. The laptop sat open on the table a few feet away, pinging like a beacon. Sidney tapped the computer awake. Mitch's black lock screen came up, and she typed in the password, Benedicione. The screen gave way to a matrix of code, way beyond the basics he'd been teaching her. But Sid's attention went to the corner of the screen, where a small icon bounced up and down. Results. One. Sydney clicked the icon, and a new window popped up. Her breath caught. She recognized the page's format from the paper she'd found crumpled in the trash. It was a profile. A distinguished man, dark skinned with a trim white beard, staring out at her from a professional photo. Alice Dumont, 57. A surgeon who'd been in an accident the year before. He hadn't abandoned his old life. Maybe that was why he hadn't shown up in the system. Not enough markers. But this, this was the important part. Ever since he'd returned to work, his patient's recovery rate had skyrocketed. There were links to news articles, pieces praising this man with a near prescient ability to discover what was wrong. She scrolled down the page until she found Dumont's current location. Merritt Central Hospital. Sydney surged to her feet and hurried down the hall. The soft hush of the shower spilled from Mitch's room. Victor's door was ajar, the space beyond dark. She could just make out the lines of his body on the bed, his back to her. The first and only time she'd ever woken him, it had been from a nightmare, and he'd lit her up like a Christmas tree. The pain had echoed in her nerves for hours. She knew it probably wouldn't happen again, but it was still hard to force herself forward. In the end, it was a wasted fear. I'm not asleep, said Victor softly. He sat up and turned to face Sidney, his eyes narrowing. What is it? Sidney's heart was racing. There's something you should see. She sat, perched on the edge of the sofa, as Victor read the profile, his expression carefully blank. She wished she could read his mind. Hell, she wished she could read his face. Mitch appeared in the doorway, large towel draped over his bare shoulders. What's going on? Get your things, said Victor, rising to his feet. We're going to merit. Roman numeral 25. Two days ago. First in white. Marcella leaned back in her chair and admired the view. The city spilled away beyond her floor-to-ceiling windows, rolled out like a carpet beneath her feet. Once upon a time, she'd stood on the rooftop of a college frat and thought she could see all of merit. But it had only been a few small blocks, the rest swallowed up by higher buildings. This was a real view. This was her city. She turned back toward the desk where the cards sat waiting. They'd arrived in a lovely silk box, one hundred crisp white invitations, the front of each embossed with an elegant gold M. She drew one from the box and flicked it open. The words were printed in curling black, the edges embossed with gold. Marcella Morgan and her associates request your presence at the exclusive reveal of Merritt's most extraordinary venture. The future of the city starts now. The Old Courthouse. This Friday, the 23rd, 6 p.m. Invitation admits two. Marcella smiled, turning the card between her fingers. What now? June had asked. You're going to throw yourself a fucking party? Marcella knew the girl had meant it as a joke, but Stell had tipped his hand the night they met and let a face card show. No more grand displays. The last thing this city needs. But of course, Stell hadn't really been talking about the city. He meant Eon. Yes, 
a little publicity would be bad for their business. And so that was exactly what Marcella planned to give them. She was done playing by other people's rules. Done hiding. If you lived in the dark, you died in the dark. But stand in the light. And it was that much harder to make you disappear. And Marcella Renee Morgan wasn't going anywhere. Roman numeral 26. Two days ago. On the road. Mitchell Turner had a bad feeling. He got them, now and then, the way other people got migraines or deja vu. Sometimes it was dull, abstract, a sense of wrongness that crept in like night, slow but inevitable. Other times it was sudden and sharp, like a pain in his side. Mitch didn't know where the feelings came from, but he knew to listen when they did. Bad feelings were warnings, when you had bad luck. In all Mitch's life, he'd had bad luck. Bad luck made sure he was the one who got caught. Bad luck landed him in jail. Bad luck crossed his path with victors, though he didn't see it at the time. It was like a rubber band. Mitch could only get so far away before the invisible hand slipped, and he went crashing back into trouble. Other people were always surprised when bad things happened, when good things stopped. Not him. When Mitch had one of those feelings, he listened, watched his step, kept one eye on the breakable things in his life. He glanced in the rearview mirror and saw Sydney curled up in her red bomber jacket, booted feet draped over doll. She was wearing a pink wig, the synthetic strands falling over her eyes. Mitch shot a surreptitious glance at the passenger seat and saw Victor staring out the window, his face unreadable as ever. Merritt rose in the distance ahead of them. Everything that goes around comes around, said Victor. His cool blue gaze cut sideways. You should keep driving. Mitch frowned in confusion. If this doesn't work, added Victor softly. Even if it does, take Sid and... We're not leaving, said Sidney, bolt upright in the back seat. Victor sighed. I should have, he murmured. The bad feeling nipped like a shadow at Mitch's heels. How long had it been following him? Days? Weeks? Months? Had it been there since the night at Falcon Price, when he set fire to Serena's body? Or was it simply the fact that when it came to Mitch's luck, it was only a matter of time before it ran out? How far? asked Sidney in the back seat. Mitch's throat felt dry when he answered. We're almost there. Fuck. June had overslept, woken with the sun full up and in her eyes. This is why she preferred killing to stalking. You could do it on your own schedule. She lurched out of bed, stumbled to the window, studied the apartments across the street. There was no sign of Sid on the balcony, no glimpse of Victor or Mitch in the rooms beyond. For days, they passed like shadows through the apartment, lounged on furniture, taken the dog for walks. Now the curtains were pulled back, and the place looked barren. June swore and got dressed. She crossed the road, caught the door just as someone was coming out. They didn't even look twice, and why should they? She was just a kid, thirteen, gangly, innocent. June loped up the stairs, shifting again before she reached the fifth floor landing, ready to pass herself off as a college kid, canvassing for politicians. She knocked on their door, but no one answered. June pressed her ear to the wood, swore again at the wall of silence, then produced a few narrow picks and let herself in. The door swung open. The apartment was empty. A horrible deja vu of another city, another abandoned place, a full year of useless searching. But June steadied herself. Sydney was no longer a stranger. They knew each other, trusted each other. June returned to her hotel room and fetched her phone from the bedside table, sighing with relief. Sydney had already texted. Sid, you'll never guess where we're going. June knew the answer before she even read Sydney's next message. Merit. Five minutes later, June was on the road, driving a solid twenty over the speed limit as she barreled toward Merritt in their wake. She called Marcella on the way. He's on the move, she said, catching herself before she said they, and headed to Merritt. Well, said Marcella, I wonder what gave him that idea. It wasn't you. No, she said, sounding a little put out. But this is better. See that he gets here safely. We'll welcome him with open arms. June frowned as she wove around a semi. I thought you were trading him to Eon. I never said that, replied Marcella pointedly. I told you I hadn't decided yet, and I haven't. 
You know I like to know my options, and I have to admit that Stell's reaction to the news of Victor Vale has piqued my interest. I've done a little homework, and this Vale is quite an interesting case. He could turn out to be an asset, or perhaps not. But I certainly don't plan on handing him over to Eon until I've had a chance to meet him. Never one to waste a weapon, thought June. Who knows, mused Marcella. Maybe he'll prove pliable. Victor struck June as many things. Pliable wasn't one of them. If anything, he seemed to be rather intransigent, cold smoke to Marcella's fire. But opposites attracted for a reason. Would it be such a bad thing? June had always assumed she'd have to pry Sidney from Victor's grasp, but maybe she wouldn't have to. Maybe he would join them. Three EOs becoming five. That was a nice number, wasn't it? Five. Almost a family. Marcella was still talking. I want you to make contact, she was saying. Arrange a meeting with our new friend. I'll send you the details. Oh, in June? Yeah. Somebody convinced Victor to come to Merritt. And it wasn't me. My money's on Eon. That would probably be a good bet. Obviously, we can't let them get to Victor first. So do try not to lose him. June swore again and gunned the engine. Four. Judgment Day. Roman numeral one. The day before. Merit. The Kingsley was a blade of a building, thrust up through the city skyline. But Victor hadn't chosen the place for the modern aesthetics. No. The selling point had been its underground parking, which mitigated the problems of exposure. A tattooed man with a shaved head, a giant black dog, and a short blonde child would always stand out, even in a city like Merit and the closed-circuit security, which Mitch would have hacked by the time they unpacked, and much to Sidney's apparent delight, a rooftop garden. Mitch sat their bags down inside the door. Don't get comfortable, said Victor. We're not staying long. Mitch and Sidney shouldn't have come at all, but Victor had long given up trying to dissuade them. Attachment was a vexing thing, as pernicious as weeds. He should have left before it ever took root. I'll be back, he said, turning toward the door. Sidney caught his arm. Be careful, she said. What a nuisance, Victor told himself, even as he rested his hand on her head. Careful is a calculated risk, he said, and I'm very good at making those. Victor pulled away, forcing Sid to let go, and left without looking back. He took the elevator to the street and stepped out alone into the afternoon sun, checking his watch. It was just after three. According to Mitch, the doctor's shift at Merritt Central ended at five. Victor would be there to meet him. Ellis Dumont. A more spiritual person might have seen the EO's sudden appearance as a sign of divine intervention, but Victor had never put much stock in fate, and even less in faith. Dumont's presence in the Matrix was convenient to the point of suspicion, his location in merit its own red flag. No, Dumont was either a gift or a trap. Victor was inclined to think the latter, but he couldn't afford to stake his life on it. His latest episode had crossed the four-minute threshold. He'd come back, but Victor knew he was playing a dangerous game. The odds were terrible, the stakes monumental. It was Russian roulette, except that a bullet would be a cleaner end. He had considered that, a quick, clean death, not a suicide, of course, a reset. But that would introduce another factor, another risk. If he died again, truly died, would Sidney be able to bring him back? And if she did, how much of his power would be left? How much of him? Four blocks later, Victor turned the corner and stepped through the sliding glass doors into a gym. He would have preferred to meet in a bar, but Dominic Rusher was five years sober, and in a moment of distraction, Victor had agreed to meet him here instead. He'd always hated gyms. He'd avoided sports in school, avoided the weight yard in prison, preferring to hone his strength in other ways. He had enjoyed swimming, once. The soothing repetition, the measured breath, the way physical mass had no bearing on skill. Now, as he strode past the hulking, sweating masses, lifting weights, he had a vivid memory of watching football players trying to swim, attacking the pool as if they could muscle it out of the way. The current worked against them. They sank like stones, spluttered for air, bested by something as simple and natural as water. Dominic was waiting for him in the locker room. At first glance, Victor hardly recognized the ex-soldier. If the last five years had whittled Victor down, they'd had the opposite effect on Dom. The change was startling. 
apparently as startling as Victor's own transformation. Dominic's eyes widened. Victor, you look... Yeah, like shit. I know. He tipped his shoulder against the steel lockers. How's the job? Dom scratched his head. Well enough, all things considered. But remember that EO I told you about? The one making a scene? Marcella. Victor hadn't meant to hold on to that name. But something about it, about her, had stuck in his mind. How long did she last? Dom shook his head. They haven't caught her yet. Really? Victor had to admit he was impressed. But the thing is, said Dom, they don't seem to be trying. And she's not exactly keeping the lowest profile. She killed six of our agents, clipped a sniper. Hell, every day she does something new. But orders are to hold. He lowered his voice. There's something going on. I just don't know what. Above my pay grade, obviously. And Eli? prompted Victor. Still in his vault. Dom shot him a nervous look. For now. Victor's eyes narrowed. What do you mean? It's just a rumor, said Dom. But apparently some of the higher-ups think he should be playing a more active role. They wouldn't do something that stupid. But then people did stupid things all the time. And Eli could charm almost anyone. Anything else? he asked. Dominic hesitated, rubbing at his neck. It's getting worse. I've noticed, said Victor dryly. Yesterday Holtz found me heaving my guts out in a closet. And last week I broke into a cold sweat in the middle of a training seminar. I've claimed hangover, PTSD, anything I can think of. But I'm running out of lies. And I'm running out of lives, thought Victor, pushing off the lockers. Good luck, called Dom as he left. But Victor didn't need luck. He needed a doctor. Sidney stepped out into the sun on the rooftop garden of the Kingsley building. It was a blue sky day, but the air was still cold. It made her think of the lake, her thirteenth birthday, the skin of ice over the melted water. Her fingers tightened on her cell. The text had come in while she was unpacking, three short words that made her nervous. June, call me, now. Sidney called. It rang and rang, and when June finally answered, all Sid heard was music too loud and fraying at the edges. June's lilting voice broke through, telling her to hold on, and a second later the music dropped away, replaced by the low hum of an engine. Sydney, said June, her voice high and clear. Just the girl I need. Hey, said Sid. We just got to Merritt. What's going on? Are you here? On my way back, said June. Had a bit of work outside the city. Look, she went on. I need you to do something for me. There was a tension in June's voice an urgency Sid had never heard before. What is it? she asked. A short exhale, like static on the line. I need you to tell me where Victor is. The words fell like a rock in Sidney's stomach. What? Listen to me, pressed the other girl. He's in trouble. There are some really dangerous people in Merritt, and they know he's here, and they're looking for him. I want to keep him safe, I do, and I can, but I need your help. Safe. Sid's mind tripped over the word. If Victor was in trouble. But why was he in trouble, and how did June know? Who was looking for him? Eon? She started to ask, but June cut her off. June, who'd never even raised her voice. Do you trust me or not? She did. She wanted to, but... Where is he, Sydney? She swallowed. Merritt Central Hospital. Roman numeral two. The day before. Merritt Central Hospital. It was seventeen minutes past five. Victor leaned back against Dumont's gray sedan in the hospital parking garage and scrolled through Dom's texts as he waited for the doctor. The buzzing in his skull seemed to ratchet up as he skimmed the most recent times. Three minutes, forty-nine seconds. Three minutes, fifty-two seconds. Three minutes, fifty-six seconds. Four minutes, four seconds. The stairwell door clattered open across the garage. Victor glanced up and saw Dumont. Dark skin, dark hair, head bowed over his tablet as he headed toward his car. Toward Victor. Victor didn't move, simply waited for the doctor to come to him. Dr. Dumont. The man looked up, brows furrowing. Victor thought he saw something cross the doctor's face. Not surprise, exactly, but fear. Can I help you? Victor studied him, fingers flexing. I certainly hope so. 
Dumont looked around the parking garage. I'm off work, he said. But you can make an appointment. Victor didn't have time for this. He took hold of the doctor's nerves and twisted. Dumont buckled with a shocked cry. He clutched his chest, sweat breaking out along his brow. Having made his point, Victor let go. Dumont sagged back against his car. You're an EO. Just like you, said Victor. I don't hurt people, said Dumont. No. Then how does your power work? Dumont let out a shaky breath. I can see how people are broken. I can see how to put them back together. Relief swept through Victor. Finally, a promising lead. Good, he said, stepping toward the doctor. Show me. Dumont shook his head. Victor was about to take hold of the doctor's nerves again, when the stairwell door swung open and a small huddle of nurses stepped out, talking animatedly. A car beeped nearby. Victor shifted to block their view. Not here, muttered Dumont. Then where, said Victor. The doctor nodded at the hospital. My office is on the seventh. No, said Victor. Too many eyes, too many doors. Dumont rubbed his forehead. The fifth floor is under renovation. It should be empty. That's the best I can do. Victor hesitated, but the humming in his head was spreading to his limbs. He was running out of time. Fine, he said. Lead the way. Meanwhile, across town. Sidney tried to call Victor, but it went straight to voicemail every time. What did June mean when she said he was in trouble? They'd been careful. They were always careful. Do you trust me or not? In that moment, Sidney had. She hoped she hadn't made a mistake. Footsteps sounded behind her. Sidney's hand went automatically to the gun she now kept tucked in her coat, thumb already resting against the safety. But then she recognized the heavy tread and turned to see Mitch striding toward her across the rooftop garden. There you are, he said cheerfully. She let go of the gun. Hey, she said, just admiring the view. She tried to keep her voice light, but her head was still spinning, and she was afraid it would show on her face, so she turned her back on Mitch. It's weird, isn't it, how cities change? Buildings go up and come down, and it looks the same, and different. Like you, said Mitch, ruffling her pink wig. The gesture was light, easy, but there was a strain in his voice and the silence, when it fell, was heavy. Sid's mind was on Victor, but she knew Mitch's was on her sister. They'd never talked about what really happened to Serena. It had been too soon, and then too late. The wound had healed, as best it could. But now that they were back in Merritt, the finished Falcon Price building glinting in the distance, the air was thick with everything they'd never said. Hey, Sid, started Mitch. But she cut him off. Do you ever wish you were an EO? Mitch's brow crinkled, caught off guard by the question. He didn't answer right away. He'd always been careful like that, sorting out his words before he said them. I remember when I first met Victor, he said at last. These guys inside were giving me a hard time, and he just... Mitch slid his hand through the air. He made it look so easy. I guess to him it probably was. But watching it made me feel... small. Sid laughed. You're the biggest guy I know. He flashed her a smile, but it was sad at the edges. Sometimes it feels like I'm in a fight, and all I've got are my hands, and the other guy has a knife. But that guy with the knife, eventually he's going to face someone with a gun, and the one with the gun is going to go up against someone with a bomb. The truth is, Sid, there will always be somebody stronger than you. That's just the way the world works. He looked up at the shining skyscraper. It doesn't matter if you're a human versus a human or a human versus an EO or an EO versus an EO. You do what you can. You fight and you win until you don't. Sidney swallowed and turned her attention back to the skyline. Any word from Victor? She asked, trying to keep her voice light. Mitch shook his head. Not yet. But don't worry. His hand came to rest on her shoulder. He can take care of himself. Merritt Central Hospital. Their steps echoed on the stairs. What exactly happens at the apex of these episodes? asked Dumont. Nerve impairment. Muscular seizure. Victor ticked off the symptoms. Atrial fibrillation. Cardiac arrest. Death. 
Dumont glanced back. Death? Victor nodded. Do you know how many times you've died? Are we talking about three to four recurrences or a dozen? One hundred and thirty-two. The doctor's face went slack. That's not possible. Victor considered him dryly. I assure you, I've kept track. But the sheer strain on your body, Dumont shook his head. You shouldn't be alive. That is both the cause and the crux of our problem, isn't it? Have you experienced cognitive impairment? Victor hesitated. There's a brief period of disorientation immediately after. And it's getting longer. It's a miracle you're still forming sentences. Miracle. Victor had always hated that word. They reached the fifth floor, and Dumont pushed open a set of doors. He hit a switch and the lights came on, one shuddering wave at a time, illuminating a broad floor that was indeed in the process of being torn apart and put back together. Plastic sheeting hung in makeshift curtains, equipment covered in white tarps, and for an instant Victor imagined himself back in the half-built Falcon Price building, voices bouncing off concrete. There are some exam rooms this way, said Dumont, but Victor refused to move. This is far enough. They were standing in the middle of the tangled space. Victor would have preferred a clean line of sight to the exits, but the tarping made that impossible. Dumont set his things down and shrugged out of his coat. How long have you been in EO? asked Victor. Two years, said the doctor. Two years. And he'd only just shown up in their search matrix. Go ahead and sit down, said Dumont, gesturing to a chair. Victor continued to stand. Tell me something, doctor. When you were dying, what were your final thoughts? My final thoughts? Echoed Dumont, considering. I thought about my family, how much I'd miss them, how I didn't want to leave. He stumbled over the answer, as if he couldn't remember. Perhaps he was simply nervous, but as he stammered, Victor was reminded of an actor forgetting their lines. And you said your power is to diagnose a person's ailments. It didn't fit. An EO's near-death experience was colored so strongly by their last moments, their will to survive, but also their dire, more desperate wishes. Dumont's final moments, final thoughts, should have shaped his power, and yet... The doctor managed a nervous smile. I thought I was meant to be diagnosing you. Victor parroted the smile. Yes, of course. Go ahead. But Dumont hesitated, patting his shirt pocket. Is something wrong? asked Victor, fingers drifting toward his holstered gun. I don't have my glasses. Dumont turned away. I must have left them downstairs. I'll just go and... But Victor was already behind him. He couldn't afford to use his power. Pain generated noise, and noise drew attention. So Victor settled for pressing the gun against the base of the doctor's spine and wrapping his free hand over the doctor's mouth. The trouble with conventional weapons, he said in the doctor's ear, is that the damage they do is so permanent. If you make a sound, you will never walk again. Do you understand? Dumont nodded once. You're not an EO, are you? A short sideways flick. No. Are they waiting for your signal? The doctor shook his head and tried to speak, his words muffled against Victor's palm. Victor drew his hand away, and the doctor repeated himself. They're already here. As if on cue, Victor heard doors swing open, the shuffle of steps. I'm sorry, continued Dumont. They have people at my house, watching my family. They said if I... Victor cut him off. Your motives are irrelevant. The only thing I need to know is how to get out. He slid the gun safety off. Exits, tell me. There's a service elevator, the others won't stop here, and two internal stairs. And of course, there was the way they'd come in, the most direct route, and the one with the least amount of cover. Boots shuffled across the linoleum nearby, the harsh overhead lights casting shadows on the plastic sheeting. Victor needed to be able to see his targets. But he didn't need to be able to see them clearly. He reached for the nearest shadow, and it buckled with a cry as the pretense of surprise shattered and shots rang out, and the fifth floor plunged into chaos. Victor's hand twitched, and two more soldiers went down screaming, before they cut the lights. A second later, he heard the telltale sound of a metal clasp, the hiss of air and then the canisters came rolling across the ground, filling the air with smoke. Hold your breath, he ordered, dragging Dumont back against the wall as scopes traced red lines through the billowing white. The smoke burned Victor's eyes, 
clawing at his senses, and through it all the crackle of energy was spreading through his limbs. Warning. Not yet, he thought. Not yet. The service elevator groaned open, and Victor had time to see the barrel of a gun, the first traces of black armor, combat boots. He twisted sideways, releasing his hostage as he ducked out of the soldier's line of fire. Dumont threw up his hands as Victor reached the stairwell. Don't shoot, called the doctor, coughing as the smoke hit his lungs. The soldiers pushed past him as Victor surged into the stairwell and started down. More footsteps rose up from below, but Victor had the high ground now. By the time the first soldier saw him, Victor already had their nerves in his grasp. He twisted the dial all the way up, and they fell, like puppets without strings. Victor rounded their bodies and continued down. He was nearly to the third floor landing when the first spasm hit. For a second, he thought he'd been shot. Then he realized, with horror, that he was out of time. The current arced through him, lighting his nerves, and he bowed his head, steadying himself against the rail before forcing his body onward. He made it to the first floor and opened the door just in time to see a soldier heading straight for him, weapon raised. Before Victor could summon the strength or the focus to bring the soldier down, someone else had done it for him. A silencer swung into view, followed by three muted thumps as the gun fired point blank into the side of the soldier's head. It wasn't enough to pierce the helmet, but it caught him off guard, and half a second later the shooter, a female doctor, stepped into sight. She stepped right into the soldier's arms, and then, almost elegantly, drove a blade up under his helmet. The soldier dropped like a stone, and the female doctor turned on Victor. Don't just stand there, she hissed, her voice strangely familiar. Footsteps sounded overhead and below. Find another way out. Victor had questions, but there was no time to ask. He turned and continued down the stairs toward the hospital sublevels, burst through a set of doors into an empty hall. The sign at the end marked morgue in small mocking letters. But beyond that, an exit sign. Halfway there, the next spasm hit, and Victor stumbled, one shoulder slamming hard into the concrete wall. His knee buckled, and he went down. He tried to force himself back up as the door swung open behind him. Stay down, ordered a soldier as Victor collapsed to the floor. We've got him, said one voice. He's down, said another. He couldn't get up, couldn't get away, but Victor still had one weapon. The current climbed higher, the dial turned up, and he held on as long as possible, clutching to life one fractured, agonizing second at a time, until the boots came into sight. And then, Victor let go, let the pain crash over him in a final wave, washing everything away. Victor came to in the dark. His vision slid in and out for a second, before finally coming into focus. He was lying on a gurney, the ceiling much lower than it should be. Victor tested his limbs, expecting to find them restrained. But there was nothing on his wrists or ankles. He tried to sit up, but pain closed tightly around his chest. Two of his ribs felt broken, but he could still breathe. I started CPR, said a voice. But I was worried it would do more damage than good. Victor turned his head and saw the figure in the dark. Dumont. The doctor was sitting on a bench a couple feet away, half hidden by shadow. Victor looked around and realized he was lying in the back of an ambulance. The seconds before his episode came back in fragments, broken frames, but they didn't explain how he'd gotten from the basement floor to here. I found you, explained the doctor, unprompted, outside the morgue. Well, I found the soldiers first. You didn't turn me over to Eon, observed Victor. Why? Dumont examined his hands. You could have killed me up on the fifth floor. You didn't. It hadn't been an act of mercy. There had simply been no point. And the soldiers, asked Victor. They were already dead. So was I. Dumont nodded. Medicine is full of calculated risks and split-second decisions. I made one. You could have walked away. I may not be extraordinary, said Dumont. But I am a doctor. And I took an oath. A siren tore through the air nearby, and Victor tensed but it was only another ambulance, pulling out of the bay. The bay? We're still at the hospital, asked Victor. Obviously, said Dumont. I said I'd help you live, not help you escape. Frankly, I was beginning to doubt your odds of doing either. Victor frowned, feeling his pockets for his phone. How long was I gone? Nearly four and a half minutes. Victor swore under his breath. 
No wonder the doctor hadn't driven away. I should run some tests, continued DeMont, producing a pen light. Make sure your cognitive function hasn't been. That won't be necessary, said Victor. There was nothing DeMont could do for him now. Nothing that would make a difference. And while four and a half minutes was far too long to be dead, it wasn't long enough for Eon's enforcement team to clear out. They would still be on site. How long until Moore joined them? Victor nodded at the front of the ambulance. I assume you can drive. Dumont hesitated. I can, but get behind the wheel. Dumont didn't move. Victor wasn't in the mood to torture him, so he resorted to logic instead. You said they had eyes on your family. If you go back in there now, they'll know you helped me escape. Dumont frowned. And how does driving you away make me less complicit? You're not an accomplice, said Victor, producing a pair of cable ties from a box. You're a hostage. I can tie you to the steering wheel now or later. It's up to you. The doctor silently climbed behind the wheel. Victor took the passenger seat. He flipped the sirens on. Where am I going? asked Dumont. Victor turned the question over. There's a bus station on the southern edge of the city. Drive. Dumont hit the gas, and the ambulance peeled out of the bay. After a few blocks, Victor killed the sirens and the lights. He sat back in the seat, flexing his fingers. He could feel the doctor cutting glances at him. Eyes on the road, said Victor. Ten minutes later, the bus depot came into sight, and Victor pointed to an empty stretch of sidewalk. There, he said. As Dumont started gliding the ambulance off the road, Victor reached over, took the wheel, and jerked it, forcing the vehicle up onto the curb. Don't forget, he said. You're in distress. Before Dumont could protest, Victor zip-tied his hands to the wheel. Do you have a phone on you? Dumont nodded at his pocket. Victor drew the cell from the doctor's coat and threw it out the window. There, he said, climbing out of the ambulance. Now he had a head start. Roman numeral three. The day before. Eon. Stell stood before the bay of screens, arms crossed, watching it all fall apart. Radio chatter crackled from the speaker on the desk. No sign of target. Soldiers down. Seal the perimeter. What a goddamn catastrophe, thought Stell, sinking down into his chair. Eli's trap had succeeded, but his own agents had failed. Three of them were dead, two bleeding from their ears and noses on a sublevel, one knifed in the throat on the first floor. The rest had been fucking useless. Whether Victor had seen past the bait to the hook or simply wriggled free, one thing was clear. He hadn't done it alone. Several of Stell's agents had been shot at by a male orderly, a receptionist, and a female doctor, but Stell had a feeling they were all the same person. One of his men had shot back, caught the doctor in the shoulder. At that same moment, halfway across the hospital, a doctor matching her exact description had collapsed, bleeding, in the middle of scrubbing in for surgery. The shapeshifter, Marcella's shapeshifter, had been there, and she'd helped Victor escape. Stell took up his phone and dialed. Joseph said that smooth voice. Where is Victor Vale? demanded Stell through gritted teeth. You are cheating. This isn't a game. You agreed to deliver him. Instead, you are the reason he's still free. When do you intend to uphold your end of the deal? Marcella sighed. Men are always so impatient. Perhaps it comes from a lifetime of being given what you want when you want it. Sometimes, Joseph, you just have to wait. When? Tomorrow, said Marcella before the party. Stell's chest tightened. What party? Didn't you get my invitation? A stack of mail sat forgotten on the edge of Stell's desk. He began rifling through it. I considered holding on to him until after. Stell found the card, crisp and white, with a gold M embossed on the front. It was unstamped. Someone had delivered it by hand. Stell broke the seal. It would certainly keep you out of my way, Marcella was saying. But then again, I wouldn't want you to miss the show. Marcella Morgan and her associates. Stell read the invitation once and then again. He couldn't believe what he was looking at. He didn't want to believe it. Merritt's most extraordinary venture. This is the opposite of lying low, he growled. What can I say? I've never been understated. We had a deal. We did, said Marcella. For two weeks. Beyond that... We both knew it wouldn't last. But I have appreciated the ceasefire. It gave me time to print my invitations. Marcella? 
but she'd already hung up. Stell swept a mug from his table. It shattered, dark drops of coffee painting the floor. In seconds, Rios was there. Sir, she asked, surveying the broken cup, the papers displaced in his search for the card, the crisp white invitation crumpled in his hand. Stell slumped back in his chair, Eli's voice playing in his head. You made a deal. Someone this powerful belongs in the ground. Send me. Stell's gaze went to the slim silver briefcase the board had given him, the collar nested inside. Agent Rios was still standing there, silent, waiting. Stell rose to his feet. Prepare a transport team for tomorrow. Rios raised a brow. For which prisoner? Cardale. Stell found Eli sitting on the edge of his cot, fingers laced and head bowed, as if he were praying. Or simply waiting. At the sound of Stell's approach, his head drifted up. Director, has my trap yielded any results? Stell hesitated. Not yet, he lied. There was no reason for Eli to know about Vale's escape, and a dozen reasons to keep him in the dark, especially considering what he was about to do. Have you been considering the problem of Marcella? Eli rose. My assessment hasn't changed. I'm not asking for your sentence, said Stell. I'm asking for your method. How would you dispatch her? How would I? You do still believe you are the best equipped for the task. A ghost of a smile. I do. Let me be very clear, said Stell. I don't trust you. You don't have to, said Eli. Stell shook his head. What was he thinking? We still don't know if you can even defeat Marcella. Eli smiled grimly. Haverty spent a year trying to find the limits of my regeneration. He never succeeded. Her power isn't the only problem, said Stell. After all, Marcella is not acting alone. Neither am I, pressed Eli, gesturing at the cell, at Eon. The hard part isn't killing three EOs, Director. It's collecting them in one place, and then separating them so they can't work together. Do that, and your agents can take care of the other two EOs, while I see to Marcella. I assure you, under the right conditions, defeating them is more than possible. Conditions. Stell slid Marcella's invitation through the fiberglass slot. Will this work? Eli took the card, his eyes dancing across the words. Yes, he said. I think it will. Roman numeral four. The night before. Merit. Victor needed a drink. He spotted a bleak stretch of low buildings, bland, forgettable, a bar sandwiched between them, and started across the street digging his cell from his pocket. Mitch answered on the second ring. We were getting worried. What happened with Dumont? It was a trap, said Victor flatly. He was only human. Mitch swore. Eon? Indeed, said Victor. I got away, but I won't risk leading them back to the Kingsley. Is that him? Called Sid in the background. What happened? Should we leave? Asked Mitch. Yes, thought Victor. But they couldn't, not now. The movement would only draw Eon's further attention. They'd set their trap at the hospital, lain in wait. They'd gotten Victor to come to them, which meant they hadn't been able to find him. But that didn't mean they wouldn't. Did they already know about Sydney? What would happen if they found her instead? Stay in the apartment, he said. Don't answer the door. Don't let anyone in. Call me if you notice anything or anyone outside. What about you? asked Mitch. But Victor didn't have an answer to that question yet so instead he hung up and stepped into the bar. It was a dive, poorly lit and more than half empty. He ordered a whiskey and settled into a booth along the back wall, where he could keep an eye on the bar's only door and the handful of patrons while he waited. Victor had pocketed a battered paperback from the center console of the ambulance. Now he dug it out, along with a black felt pen, and let the broken spine fall open under his hand. Old habits. The pen cut a steady path, blacking out the first line, and then the second. He felt his pulse slow with each erasure, each measure of text reduced to a solid black streak. The first word was always the hardest to find. Now and then he searched for a specific one, and then erased the text around it, but most of the time, though Victor was loath to admit it, even to himself, the practice felt less like a physical act than a metaphysical one. He let the pen skate across the page, waiting for a word to stop its path. He cut through pride, fall, change, before finally coming to a stop at the word find. 
His pen skipped over a solo A two lines later, then continued down the page until it found way. Victor was running out of time and out of leads, but he wasn't giving up. Sidney, Mitch, Dominic, they all behaved as though surrender were a risk, an option, but it wasn't. Some fractional part of Victor wished he could stop trying, stop fighting, but it simply wasn't in him. That same stubborn will to survive, the very trait that first made him into an EO, now prevented him from acquiescing, from admitting defeat. Whatever's happened to you, however you're hurt, you've done it to yourself. That's what Campbell had said. And the EO was right. Victor had always been the master of his fate. He had climbed onto that steel table. He had coerced Angie into flipping the switch. He had goaded Eli into killing him five years before, knowing Sidney would bring him back. Every action has been his own design, every step his own making. If there was a way out of this, he would find it. If there wasn't, he would make one himself. The bar's only door swung open, and a few moments later Victor heard a voice, the words lost in the crowd, but the accent unmistakable. He looked up. There was a small brunette woman with fox-sharp features leaning across the bar. He'd never seen the person before, but Victor knew it was her, the woman from the strip club. The concerned Samaritan from the alley, too, and, of course, most recently, the doctor who'd helped him escape Eon. It wasn't just the accent that Victor recognized. It was the look in the woman's eyes, behind her eyes, really, and she glanced toward him, the mischievous smile that lit her face. If it was her face, they were an EO. That much was obvious. He watched as the shapeshifter took up their drink and headed toward him. Is this seat taken? Again, that lilting voice. That depends, said Victor. The glass tower. Was that the first time we met? A wry smile cut across the vulpine face. It was but not the last. No, said the EO, sinking into the chair across from him. Not the last. Victor curled his fingers around his glass. Who are you? Think of me as a kind of guardian angel. You can call me June. Is that your real name? Ah, said June wistfully. Real is a murky thing for someone like me. The woman sat forward, and as she did, she changed. There was no hinge, no transition. The brunette girl dissolved replaced by strawberry curls and dark blue eyes in a heart-shaped face. Do you like it? asked June, as if she were asking his opinion of a new dress, not a distorted reflection of the only girl Victor had ever loved. It's the best I can do, considering the real one is dead. Change, said Victor tersely. Ah, oh, June sulked. But I picked her just for you. Change, he ordered. The blue-eyed gaze leveled on him, a challenge, a dare. Victor rose to meet it. His fingers twitched as he took hold of her nerves, turning the dial in her chest. But if the woman felt any pain, it didn't register on her face. Her power, somehow it was shielding her. Sorry, said June with a wan smile. You can't hurt me. A faint emphasis on the last word. Victor leaned forward. I don't need to. He splayed his hand across the worn wood table, pinning her body to the chair. A faint crease formed between June's eyes, the only hint of struggle as she fought his hold. There are so many nerves in a human body, said Victor. Pain is only one of the possible signals, a single instrument in a symphony. A smirk fought its way onto the girl's mouth. But how long do you think you can hold me? An hour? A day? Until your next death? I wonder, which one of us will give up first? They were at an impasse. Victor let go. June exhaled, rolling her neck. As she did, the girl with the strawberry curls fell away, replaced by the brunette she'd been wearing before. There. All better? Why have you been following me? asked Victor. I have a vested interest, said June, and I'm not the only one. There's an EO in this city who would very much like to meet you. Perhaps you've heard of her. Marcella Riggins. The EO currently treating Merritt like her own personal playground, the one who, against all odds, had yet to burn out. I see, said Victor slowly. So you're just the messenger. A flicker of annoyance crossed June's face. Hardly. Then why, he asked, would I want to meet with Marcella? June shrugged. Curiosity? The fact you've got nothing to lose? Or maybe you'll do it for Sidney's sake. Victor's expression darkened. Is that supposed to be a threat? No, said June. 
and for once there was no mischief, no malice in her voice. Her expression was open, honest. She hadn't changed faces, but the difference was just as striking. I do care what happens to that girl. You don't even know her. Everyone's got secrets, Victor. Even our darling Sid. How do you think I found you today at Merritt Central? She looks out for you, and you should be doing the same for her. I know you're sick. I've seen you die. And we both know Sydney's got a long life ahead. What happens when you're not around to protect her? The earnestness dissolved, replaced once more by that wry twist of the lips, that sly glint of light behind the eyes. She's a powerful girl, our Sid. She'll need allies when you're gone. And we both know you already killed her first choice. Victor looked down into his drink. Is that what Marcella is, then? An ally? Marcella, said June pointedly, is powerful. What exactly is her power? Come see for yourself. June swiped the battered paper bag and pen. Tomorrow, she said, scribbling the details on the inside cover. And just so you know, she added, rising, when Marcella makes an offer, she only does it once. She nudged the book back toward him. Don't waste it. Roman numeral five. The night before. First in white. June hummed softly as the elevator rose. When she reached the top floor, she found two men in dark suits standing outside the penthouse door. They were new, and one had the poor sense to try to stop her as she passed. Where do you think you're going? June looked down at the hand on her shoulder. When she looked back up at the man, she was him, down to the last hairy knuckle and acne scar. I go where I please, she said, her accent coming through in his deep voice. The security pulled back as if burned. I'm I'm sorry, he said, genuine fear flashing across his face. That, that was a pleasant change. She'd gotten surprise, shock, even awe once or twice, but never such a simple thing as fear. They hadn't known who she was, but they knew what, an E.O., and it clearly scared the shit out of them. Maybe Marcella was right. Maybe E.O.s shouldn't be the ones hiding. Not to worry, said June, cheerfully, shifting back into the brunette. Honest mistake. They scrambled to open the door, and she stepped into the penthouse, marveling a little at the strange comfort of returning. We really need a dog, she thought. Something to greet you when you get home. She reached the open living room, where Jonathan sat slumped on a leather sofa, palms pressed against his eyes. Johnny boy, why so glum? Her steps slowed at the sight of a large red-brown stain on the floor. Well, that's new. Yeah, said Jonathan, looking up. She's been busy. I can see that. And where's our fearless leader tonight? Jonathan didn't answer. Didn't need to. Marcella's voice streamed from her office. Why would I want flowers? They're lilies, said a man's voice. I thought they'd make an elegant centerpiece. I'm the elegant centerpiece. Without something to soften the space, I'm afraid it will look awfully austere. This is the beginning of a new age, snapped Marcella. Not a fucking sweet sixteen. Get rid of them. The man hesitated. If you're sure. June heard the telltale click of heels on marble. Well, perhaps you do know best. There was a shuffle, a gasp, and June stepped through the door just in time to see the man crumble in Marcella's grip. Oh, I've missed this, said June pleasantly, as what was left of the man fell to the floor. She considered the ruined heap, adorned only by a few tattered bits of silk and a silver cufflink. Marcella was burning hotter, faster, and as far as June could tell, she still had yet to find her limit. Marcella leaned back against her desk and took up a cloth, wiping her hands. I've always hated having to repeat myself. She glanced up. Shouldn't you be watching over our new arrival? I've had enough babysitting for one day, said June. I delivered your message. And? He's a tough one to predict, but I think he'll come. I certainly hope so, said Marcella. I am glad you made it back in time. For what? asked June. Marcella handed her a card. June took it up, turned it over, eyes flitting over the paper. She shook her head, baffled and amused. Jesus, Marcella. Anyone ever told you that you're batshit crazy? Marcella pursed her lips. Several times, she said. It's an insult men love to aim at ambitious women. But aren't you forgetting, June? This was your idea. It was a joke, and you know it. June flicked the card away. How many people did you send that to? Marcella ticked them off on her fingers. The mayor, the chief of police, the district attorney, the director of Eon. She waved her hand, 
and a few hundred of the most powerful, well, formerly most powerful people in this fine city. June shook her head in disbelief. Drawing this kind of attention is a very bad idea. You're putting a target on our backs. There's already one there. Haven't you noticed? They're going to come for us one way or another, June. And if we stay hidden, no one will ever know we were there. So let them see us. Let them see what we can do. Marcella smiled, that radiant, seductive smile. Admit it, June. There's a part of you that wants to stand in that light. No more running. No more hiding. Marcella didn't understand that June would always be hiding. But the woman was right about one thing. People had tried to bend June, tried to break her, tried to make her feel small. Perhaps it was time for them to understand how small they were. June could never be herself, not the self she was before. But she could be someone. She could be seen. And when Eon came calling, well, they wouldn't catch her. Which left only one question, really. Who was she going to wear? Roman numeral six. The last morning. Merit. Sydney crashed to her hands and knees on the ice. She tried to get away, but Eli grabbed the collar of her coat, dragging her backward. Come now, Sydney, he said. Let's finish what we started. She sat up, gasping for air. Sid didn't remember falling asleep. She'd spent most of the night tossing and turning, restless. It wasn't the Kingsley. She'd spent five years getting used to strange new places. It was Victor. Or rather, his absence. The apartment felt wrong. Too empty without him. He had a way of taking up space, and even when he started to move like a ghost, coming and going, he never stayed gone. There was always that thread connecting him to Sydney, and whenever he was out late, she'd lie in bed and feel it spool away beneath her hand, and then draw tight when he returned. But Victor hadn't come back last night. Dumont had been a trap, and Victor had almost been caught in it. He'd gotten away, and wouldn't come back until it was safe. He'd gotten away, and Sidney knew he'd had help. She checked her phone again, saw the notes from last night. Sid, thank you. June, of course. Winking face emoticon. Sid got up and wandered out of her room, found Mitch at the table, twisting a pair of wires and fitting them into a small black box. Sidney was always amazed that such big hands could do such precise work. What's that? she asked. Mitch smiled. Just a precaution, he said, holding up the device. She realized she'd seen it before, or something like it, spotted them in the corners of doorways whenever she and Mitch and Victor played house. Have you heard from him? Mitch nodded. This morning, he said. And as soon as he gets back, we're leaving. Sidney's chest tightened. She couldn't leave Merritt, not yet. Not before she tried. She ducked back into her room and got dressed, pulled on the boots and the bomber jacket and then went to the dresser, where she'd hidden the small red tin. She tucked the box deep in her pocket and started out into the apartment and toward the front door. Come on, doll, she called. The dog drew up his lazy head. Sid, said Mitch, we need to stay inside. And he needs a walk, protested Sidney. Doll, for his part, didn't seem excited. I took him out earlier on the rooftop, said Mitch. The building's gardener won't be happy, but it'll have to do. I'm sorry, kiddo. I don't like being cooped up either, but it isn't safe. Sidney shook her head. If Eon knew where we were, they would have already come for us. Mitch sighed. Maybe, but I'm not willing to take the chance. There was a steadiness to his words, a stern resolve. Sidney chewed her lip, considering. Mitch had never prevented her from leaving before, not physically. She wondered if he would. She didn't want to make him do that. She sighed, shrugging out of her coat. Fine. Mitch relaxed, visibly relieved. All right. I'll start lunch. You hungry? Sid smiled. Always, she said. I'm going to take a shower first. Mitch was already in the kitchen turning on the stove as she slipped down the hall, tugging the coat back on. She went straight past the bathroom and into Mitch's bedroom, sliding the window open as Doll padded into the room behind her. Stay, she whispered. The dog opened his mouth as if to bark, but his tongue simply lolled. Good boy, she said, swinging her leg over the sill. Keep Mitch safe. Sid was about to climb down the fire escape, but then she hesitated, digging out the playing card she always kept with her, the one Victor had plucked from the fallen deck so long ago, and then slipped like a secret into her palm. 
the king of spades. It was battered now, edges worn from five years of back pockets, a rough crease along the middle. In their game, a face card meant freedom. Sid told herself she wasn't breaking the rules, and if she was, well, she wasn't the only one. She dropped the card on the floor and tugged the window shut behind her. Roman numeral seven. The last morning. Downtown Merritt. Victor stood on the street, the stolen paperback open in his hand. He lingered in the bar until just after midnight before checking into a nearby motel, the kind that clearly wasn't eager to draw police attention. After a few restless hours on creaking springs, he'd gotten up again and walked the thirty-four blocks through the waking heart of Merritt to the address June had scribbled inside the battered front cover. 119 Alexander Place, 12 p.m. It was, of all things, an art gallery. Large glass windows looked out onto the curb, revealing glimpses of the paintings inside. It was almost noon, and Victor hadn't decided yet if he was going in. He weighed the options in his mind, along with June's words. It could simply be another kind of trap, or it could be an opportunity. But in the end, it was sheer curiosity that propelled him forward. For the EO who had managed to evade Eon's net. For the woman who had held her ground instead of running. Victor crossed the street, climbed the three short steps, and stepped into the Whitehall Gallery. It was larger than it looked from the street. A series of broad, blank rooms linked together by archways. Abstract paintings dotted the walls, blotches of color against the white. In his black attire, Victor felt like an ink spill. Ideal for slipping through crowds on the street, but far more conspicuous in such a stark environment. So he didn't bother trying to blend in, didn't pretend to admire the art, simply set off to find Marcella. A handful of men and women stood scattered through the rooms, but none of them were real patrons. Victor glimpsed holsters beneath fitted suits, fingers resting on the open mouths of handbags. Hired guns, he thought, wondering if June was hidden among them. He didn't spot anyone with her tells but he did find Marcella. She was in the largest gallery, facing away from him, her black hair pulled up, a silk blouse dipping low between her shoulder blades. Still, he knew it was her, not because he'd seen a photograph, but because of the way she stood, with all the casual grace of a predator. Victor was used to being the strongest person in the room, and it was both familiar and unsettling to see that confidence on someone else. They weren't alone in the room. A thin man in a black suit leaned against the wall between two paintings. His dark hair was slicked back, his eyes hidden behind a pair of sunglasses. The white walls made the gallery unnaturally bright, but not bright enough to merit shades, meaning they served an alternate purpose. I've never understood art, mused Marcella, loud enough for Victor to know she was addressing him. I've been to a hundred galleries, stared at a thousand paintings, waiting to feel inspired or awestruck or enamored but the only thing I ever really felt was bored. As Victor watched, she reached out and pressed one gold nail to the surface of the painting. Under Marcella's touch, the canvas rotted and crumbled, pieces drifting to the floor. Don't worry, she said, turning on one metal heel. I own the building and everything in it. She raised a brow. Except for you, of course. She gave him a cursory look. Do you like art, Mr. Vale? My husband did. He always had a fondness for beautiful things. Marcella lifted her chin. Do you think I'm beautiful? Victor considered her. The willowy limbs, the red lips, the blue eyes framed by thick black lashes. He glanced from her to the ruins of the painting on the gallery floor and back. I think you're powerful. Marcella smiled, clearly pleased with the answer. Victor sensed a ghost of movement at his back and glanced over his shoulder to see another man enter the room, one with a goatee and a mischievous smile. I believe you've already met June, said Marcella, in one form or another. The man winked, that telltale light in his eyes. And this is Jonathan, said Marcella, flicking her fingers in the direction of the thin man against the wall. Jonathan didn't answer, beyond the slight nod of his head. So, said Victor. Instead of art, you're collecting EOs. Marcella's red lips split into a smile. Do you know what I wanted to be when I grew up? President? Her smile widened. Powerful. Her steel heels clicked against the marble as she came toward him. When you think about it, it's really all anyone ever wants. Once upon a time, power was determined by lineage, the age of blood. Then it was determined by money, the age of gold. 
But I think it's time for a new age, Victor. The age of power itself. Let me guess, said Victor. I'm either with you or against you. Marcella tisked. Such black and white thinking. I swear men are so busy looking for enemies, they rarely remember to make friends. She shook her head. Why can't we work together? I work alone. Marcella raised a knowing brow. Now we both know that's not true. Victor's eyes narrowed. But he said nothing. Marcella seemed more than happy to hold the stage. Money in the right hands can get all kinds of things. Knowledge, insight, Eli Evers' files from his time with the Merritt PD, perhaps. He and Serena Clark made quite a pair. But I think you got the better deal with her little sister, Sydney. Victor kept his poise. But across the room, June stiffened, the color draining from her face. Marcella. But the woman held up a hand, gold nails catching the light. I've heard about your own talents, she continued. I'd like to see them for myself. You want me to audition? Her lips twitched. Call it what you like. I've shown you mine. And Jonathan's, and June's for that matter. I think it's only fair. Victor needed no further prompting. He flexed his hand toward the thin man in the suit, expecting him to buckle immediately, and was surprised when instead, the air in front of him flashed blue and white with an almost electric crackle. And beyond that, nothing happened. Strange. Victor could feel the other man's nerves, just as present as before he'd tried to impact them. But in that exact instant, it had been like a short circuit, almost like lightning trying to strike something grounded. A force field. Marcella smiled. Oh, sorry. I should have said Jonathan's off limits. She looked around. A little help. She hardly raised her voice, but the room began to fill. The six men and women Victor had passed earlier came spilling in. Marcella smiled. I have a reward, she said, for whoever brings this man to his knees. For a moment, no one moved. And then everyone did. A brick of a man lunged toward him, and Victor took hold of nerves and twisted violently. The man buckled, screaming, as Victor leveled the two approaching in his wake, then turned toward a woman as she drew a blade. A conductor's flick of Victor's fingers, and she collapsed too. The fifth went down on his side, curling in against the pane. While the sixth tried to reach for his gun, Victor forced his hand flat to the marble and continued turning the dials up until all six writhed and spasmed on the floor. He held Marcella's gaze, waiting for her to say enough, order him to stop, waiting for any sign of her discomfort. But Marcella only watched the scene unfold, her blue eyes bright, unflinching. Up until then, she had reminded Victor of Serena, expecting the world to bend to her will. But in that moment, she reminded him of Eli. That zealous light in her eyes, the coiled energy, the conviction. Victor had seen enough. He turned his power on Marcella. Not a subtle impression, either, but a sudden, blunt force blow, strong enough to fry nerves and level a body. She should have collapsed on the spot, buckled like dead weight to the cold marble. Instead, Marcella took a single surprised breath, and then Jonathan's head flicked imperceptibly toward her. As soon as it did, the air crackled, the space around Marcella filling with the same blue-white flare that had shielded Jonathan moments before. Victor realized his error. Marcella was more like Eli than he'd guessed. Her uncanny self-assurance was an arrogance born from invincibility, albeit a borrowed one. Victor dropped his hold on the rest of the room and left them gasping on the floor. Marcella pursed her lips as the shield flickered out. That wasn't very sporting. Forgive me answered Victor dryly. I guess I got carried away. He looked down at the men and women on the floor. I take it I failed your test. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Your performance was illuminating. Marcella produced a crisp white envelope. June took the card and delivered it to Victor. What's this? he asked. An invitation. They stood there for a second, neither willing to put their back to the other. At last, Marcella broke into a smile. You can see yourself out, she said. But I do hope we meet again. Victor wanted nothing less, but he had a feeling they would. Well, said Marcella, watching Victor go. That was enlightening. June hadn't said a word since Marcella mentioned Sydney, hadn't trusted herself to speak. Now she cleared her throat. Do you still think he might be useful? Undoubtedly, said Marcella, taking out her phone. Should I follow him? No need. Marcella punched in a number, 
I've seen enough. Someone answered and Marcella said, He's staying at the Kingsley on 15th. But right now he's moving west on Alexander. Happy hunting, Joseph. June's stomach dropped. How did Marcella already know where they were staying? Where Sidney was staying? She gave June a bland look. You didn't think you were the only one keeping an eye on things, did you? June swallowed. Do what you want with Victor. But Sidney isn't a part of this. Maybe she wouldn't have been, said Marcella pointedly, if you'd told me the truth about the girl's power instead of keeping her to yourself. She flicked her fingers dismissively toward the door. But go ahead. See if you can get to her before they do. Roman numeral eight. The last morning. The Kingsley. Sydney, called Mitch, flipping the grilled cheese in the pan. She didn't answer. That bad feeling, the one he'd had on the way to Merritt, began to crystallize from a general dread into something specific, like the vague first signs of an illness that suddenly sharpened into the flu. Sydney, he called again, shifting the pan off the stove so lunch wouldn't burn. He started toward the bathroom, slowing when he noticed the door was open, as was the door to Sid's room, and the one to his own. Mitch glimpsed a black tail swishing absently just inside the door and found Dahl sprawled on his bedroom floor, facing the window, and chewing on a scrap of paper. Mitch knelt down and pried the paper from the dog's lolling mouth, stilling at the side of the crown, the sideways profile. It was a face card. The king of spades. Mitch was on his feet, already dialing Sidney's cell. It rang and rang and rang, but no one answered. He swore and was just about to chuck the phone onto the bed when it went off in his hand. Mitch answered, praying it was Sid. Pack up, ordered Victor. We're leaving. Mitch made an uneasy sound. What is it? demanded Victor. Sydney, said Mitch. She's not here. A short exhale. Where? I don't know. I was making lunch and... Victor cut him off. Just find her. Sydney stood on the curb, looking up. Five years ago, the Falcon Price had been a construction project, Rebar and concrete surrounded by a plywood fence. Now it rose high above her, a gleaming tower of glass and steel. All the evidence of the crimes committed that night hidden beneath fresh cement, drywall, plaster. She didn't know what she'd expected to find, what she'd expected to feel. A ghost? A remnant of her sister? But now that Sidney was here, she could only see Serena rolling her eyes at that idea. Sid knelt, reached into her bag for the secret she'd carried so long. She eased the lid off the red metal tin, folded back the strip of cloth. For the first time in five years, Sidney let her fingers skim the soot-covered shards of bone. The finger joint, the piece of rib, the knot of a hip bone. All that was left of Serena Clark. All that was left, besides whatever was left here. Sidney laid the bones out on top of their cloth wrapping, arranged them just so, leaving a fraction of space for the missing, drawing imaginary lines where the other bones should be. She took a deep, shuddering breath, and was about to bring her hands to the remains when her phone rang, the high sound cutting through the quiet. How stupid. She should have shut it off. If she had already gotten started, if her hands and her mind had been reaching past the bones when that noise happened, Sidney could have lost the threat, could have fumbled her only chance, ruined everything. She dug the phone from her pocket and saw Mitch's name flash across the screen. Sidney switched the cell off and turned her attention back to her sister's bones. Roman numeral nine. The last afternoon. Eon. What do you mean, transport protocol? Dominic had been in the locker room, buttoning up his uniform shirt, when Holtz burst in, face bright. He'd finally been tapped for field duty, or rather for transport. They're letting Stell's hunting dog out, he said. Dom's chest tightened. What? Eli Cardale, they're letting him out of his cage to go after that crazy mob wife, the one who killed Bara. Dom was on his feet. They can't. Well, they are, said Holtz. When? Right now. Orders came in from the director. He was going to handle it himself, but there's some big op going down in the city, another EO, and Stell just blew through like a storm. Before he left, he told us to initiate the extraction. But Dom was still stuck on the words before. Another EO? Yeah, said Holtz pulling a suit of matte black armor from the wall. That mystery guy, the one who's been killing off other EOs. Dom's mouth had gone dry. What are the odds, mused Holtz. 
So much excitement in one day. Holtz finished strapping in and turned to go, but Dominic caught his arm. Wait. The other soldier frowned down at the place where Dom's fingers dug into his sleeve. But what could Dom say? What could he do? He couldn't stop the missions. All he could do was warn Victor. Dom forced himself to let go. Just be careful, he said. Don't go ending up like Bara. Holtz flashed that cheerful, dogged smile and was gone. Dominic counted to ten, then twenty, waiting until Holtz's steps had receded, until he was left with only the thud in his heart. Then he walked out of the locker room, turned right, and headed for Stell's office, and the only phone inside the building. He kept his gait even, his steps casual, but with every forward stride, Dom knew he was going further down a one-way road. He stopped outside the director's door. Last chance to turn around. Dom pushed open the door and stepped inside. Victor knew he was being followed. He sensed the weight of their steps, felt their attention like a drag. At first he assumed it was June, or one of Marcella's human guards, but as their steps quickened and the sound of one person became two, Victor began to suspect another source. He'd been heading directly back to the Kingsley, now he veered left, cutting through a crowded stretch of downtown Merritt's restaurants and cafes. His phone buzzed in his pocket. He didn't recognize the number, but answered without slowing his step. They're on to you, said Dominic, his voice low, urgent. Yeah, said Victor, thanks for the heads up. It gets worse, said Dom. They're letting Eli out. The words were a knife, driven so precisely between Victor's ribs. To catch me? No, said Dom. I think it's actually meant to catch Marcella. Victor swore under his breath. You can't let that happen. How am I supposed to stop it? Figure it out, said Victor, hanging up. He could feel them lapping at his heels, hear the sound of car doors swinging closed. Victor crossed the street and stepped into a nearby park, a sprawling network of running paths, vendor carts, open lawns, packed tight with people in the midday sun. He didn't look back. He hadn't been able to pick his pursuers out of the crowd, not yet. Population was working in their favor, but it could also work in his. Victor picked up his pace, allowing a hint of urgency to creep into his stride. Catch up, he thought. He heard a set of steps quickening, clearly expecting him to break into a run. Instead, Victor turned on his heel. He doubled back on the crowded path and started walking again in the opposite direction, forcing his pursuer to either stop and retreat or maintain the illusion by continuing toward him. Nobody stopped. No one retreated. Usually, people bent away from Victor, their attention veering like water around a stone. But now, in the tangle of joggers and walkers and ambling groups, one man was still looking straight at him. The man was young and dressed in civilian clothes, but he had the gait of a soldier, and the moment their eyes met, a ripple of tension crossed the younger man's face. He drew a gun, but as he swung the weapon up, Victor flicked his own fingers, a single vicious pull of an invisible thread, and the man fell to his knees on the path, the gun skidding out of his hand. Victor kept walking as the crowd turned, half in worry at the man's scream, and half in horror at the sight of the weapon on the park's pavement. Chaos erupted, and in that chaos, Victor cut left onto a different path, aiming for the street side of the park. Halfway there, a second figure rushed toward him, a woman with cropped dark hair. She didn't draw a weapon, but she had one hand to her ear, and her lips were moving. A group of cyclists whipped around the corner, and Victor cut across the path just before they passed, a sudden whooshing barricade that bought him just enough time to step between two carts and out of the park. Victor moved swiftly, cutting across traffic and down a side street, seconds before an unmarked van skidded around the corner at the other end. It drove straight at him. He reached for the man behind the wheel, turning the dial up until the driver lost control, and the van veered, slamming into a hydrant. Victor heard more footsteps, the hiss of radio static. He ducked into the nearest subway stop, swept past the turnstile and down the stairs, taking them two at a time toward the train pulling into the station below. He made his way to the very end of the platform, but instead of boarding the train, he slipped past the pedestrian barricade and into the mouth of the tunnel, pressing his body against the wall as the bells chimed and the subway doors hissed shut. A man reached the platform just in time to watch the train slide by. Victor lingered in the tunnel, watching the man scan the cars, hands on his hips his black hair edging to gray. Stell. Even after five years, Victor recognized him immediately. He watched as the former detective turned around, finally, and stormed back up the stairs. Victor knew he should try again to get to the Kingsley, 
But first, he needed to have a word with the director of Eon. The next train pulled in, and Victor slipped into the press of bodies following in Stell's wake. Roman numeral 10. The last afternoon. Eon. Dom stared at Stell's bank of computer screens. Figure it out. His mind spun like tires in mud, searching for purchase, his attention flicking from the desk to the door to the grid of camera footage on the far wall. There, upper right, three soldiers in full gear moved down a white hall. In another window, the familiar shape of Eli Cardell sat waiting. Fuck. Dom turned toward the trio of screens on Stell's desk. He didn't know the first thing about hacking into computers. But he knew someone who did. Mitch answered on the second ring. Who is this? Mitch, it's Dominic. A shuffle of movement. This isn't a good time. Footsteps sounded in the hall beyond Stell's office. Dom pressed the cell to his chest and held his breath. When they were gone, he raised the phone, talking quickly. Sorry, but I'm working on Victor's orders. Aren't we all? I need to hack a computer. The metal sound of a zipper sliding. What kind? The kind at Eon. The line went quiet, and Dom assumed Mitch was thinking, but then he heard a laptop click open, a booting sound. What kind of encryption? No idea. He tapped the computer away. It's just a password screen. Mitch made a sound like a muffled laugh. Governments. Okay, do exactly what I tell you. He started speaking a foreign language. That's what it sounded like, anyway. But Dom did as he was told, and three agonizing minutes later, a green access granted appeared on the screen. And he was in. Dom hung up, brought up the grid of folders, each one marked by a cell number. Every other computer in Eon had a folder like this one, and every other folder started with cell 1. But Stell's computer had another option. Cell 0. Dom opened the drive, and Eli Ever, Elliot Cardale, appeared on screen, sitting at a table in the center of his cell, turning through a black folder. As Dom keyed in the codes, his vision sharpened, his focus narrowing the way it had when he was in the field. Time seemed to slow. Everything fell away except the screen, the commands, and the blur of his fingers across the keyboard. A second window appeared with the cell block controls, scanning past lighting and temperature to security, emergency, lockdown. Dominic couldn't prevent Eon from letting Eli out, but he could slow them down. He was just about to key in the codes Mitch had given him, send the whole cell into lockdown, when someone cleared their throat behind him. Dom spun around and saw Agent Rios standing there, looking unimpressed. He didn't have time to wonder where she'd come from, didn't even have time to step out of time into the safety of the shadows, before Rios slammed a cattle prod into his chest, and Dom's world went white. Eli was getting restless. He scanned the images in the black folder one last time as he waited for Stell. The director had made the plan very clear. Eli would be escorted from the facility under guard, and upon completion of the mission, returned to his cell. If he disobeyed in any way, at any point, he would be returned to the lab instead, where he would spend the rest of his existence being dissected. That was Stell's plan. Eli had his own. Steps sounded beyond the wall, and he set his file aside and rose, expecting as usual to see Stell. Instead, when the wall went clear, he saw a fleet of Eon soldiers dressed in black, their faces hidden behind sleek, close-fitting masks. Even with the visors up, only their eyes were visible. One pair green, one blue, one brown. All this fuss, muttered Green Eyes, sizing him up. Doesn't look all that dangerous to me. Oh, said Eli, crossing the cell. There are EOs out there far more dangerous than I am. But how many people have they killed? Asked Blue Eyes. I'm guessing it's less than you. Eli shrugged. That depends. On what? Asked Brown Eyes, a woman judging by her voice. Whether you consider EOs people, said Eli. Enough, said Blue Eyes, stepping toward the barrier. Let's get going. Eli held his ground. Where is Director Stell? Busy. Eli doubted Stell would hand over such a delicate task, unless it was truly urgent. Or personal. Could Stell have already found Victor? Ships in the night, thought Eli grimly, but he couldn't afford to worry about Victor Vale right now. Inmate, ordered Blue Eyes. Approach the divide and put your hands through the slot. Eli did, felt the heavy metal cuffs close around his wrists. Now turn around, 
Place her back to the slot and kneel. Eli hesitated. That wasn't protocol. Cautiously, he did as he was told, expecting a dark hood to come down over his head. Instead, cold metal slid around his throat. Eli tensed, resisted the urge to pull away as the steel closed around his throat. The hunting dog gets a collar, said Blue Eyes. Eli stood, running his fingers along the band of metal. What is this? Brown Eyes held up a slim remote. Didn't think we'd let you out without a leash. She pressed a button, and a single high note, like a warning tone, sounded in Eli's ears, before pain pierced the back of his neck. Eli's vision went white, his body folding beneath him. And down he goes, said Blue Eyes as he hit the cell floor. Eli couldn't move, couldn't feel anything below the shard of metal driven between his vertebrae. Come on, Samson, said Green Eyes. We're on a schedule. The tone sounded again, and the steel spike withdrew. Eli gasped, chest lurching as his spine healed, and sensation flooded back into his limbs. He pushed himself to his hands and knees, and then up to his feet. A small pool of blood on the cell floor was the only sign of what they'd done. Brown Eyes waved the remote. You try to escape? You try to attack us? Hell, you piss us off? I'll put you down. Eli studied the slim remote in the soldier's hand, and wondered if it was the only one. Why would I do that, he said. We're on the same side. Yeah, sure, said Green Eyes, thrusting a hood through the slot. Put it on. Eli was led blind and bound through doorways and down halls, a soldier gripping each arm. He felt the ground shift beneath him from concrete to linoleum, and then to asphalt. The air changed, a breeze grazing his skin, and he wished the hood were off, wished he could see the sky, breathe in fresh air. But there would be time for that. A few feet more, and then their progress halted. Eli was turned around, maneuvered until his back came up against the metal side of a van. Doors swung open, and he was half dragged into the back of the van, forced a little too roughly onto a steel bench against one wall. A strap went around his legs, another around his chest. His handcuffs were locked to the bench seat between his knees. The soldiers climbed in, and the doors were thrown shut, and the van's engine revved as it pulled away from Eon. Eli smiled beneath the hood. He was cuffed and collared, but he was one step closer to free. Roman numeral 11. The Last Afternoon. The Falcon Price. A couple years ago, Mitch had taught Sidney about magnets. They'd spent a whole day testing their effects, the attraction and repulsion. Sid had always thought of magnetic force as a pull, but she'd been shocked to discover the strength of their push. Even a small flat disk could exert so much force against another. She felt that same repulsion now, as her fingers hovered over her sister's bones. Sidney tried to will her hands down as something inside her heart pushed back. Why couldn't she do it?